Welcome back to the channel. On today's episode, we're gonna be talking about rust removal on this 64 Malibu trunk pan. We've got Justin removing the floor pan today, and I think a lot of guys see rust or rot, and they just think it's overwhelming and too much work, and maybe they can't do that. Today, we wanna to be diving into some of the tips and tricks that we did with this project to make it not so frustrating, and that way, at the end of it, you guys have a good understanding of what tools you're gonna to need and how to set up all of your plug welds. Stay tuned to the end of this video where we're gonna actually test the plug weld and show you guys how to set up your welder and what you're actually looking for to get something that's solid and not gonna fall out of the bottom of the car. You guys have to research whatever car you're working on and whatever panel, if that panel is even gettable. Can you buy that panel? Do they remanufacture that panel? And buy the panel have it in your possession before you actually cut that out of the car. We wanna dive into what tools we use to remove this floor pan, how to do it in a timely manner. This whole floor pan was removed in about eight hours. And that's pretty good for one guy by himself just boogieing. Once we got the trunk pan in our possession, we verified that all of the mounts, all the brackets that we needed are were in, were in place on the car. Once we had all those verified, we went around and marked out what areas we're going to be removing and what areas we're going to keep. Don't think you know, have the panel close by so you can reference it. And then figure out what can just be hacked out. We used a sawzaw to be able to go in and just remove the main section of the floor. That way it's not hard to get a drill in and you're not in some awkward position bent upside down like a pretzel. Just cut the whole center out so that way you can work each section. The other thing we're gonna be using is a Blair cutter it is a carbide bit with a spring-loaded drill inside, and what you're gonna be doing is using that to remove a plug weld. A plug weld is just two pieces of sheet metal that has a hole in one, and you are welding it up. You can use a pro spot machine, you can use a sheet metal spot welder where it puts force and clamps it, that's optimal, but a lot of guys just have a standard MIG welder or TIG welder in their garage or shop that they want to weld that panel in. Before you actually get to using that Blair cutter and put that spring-loaded drill bit over that plug weld, we like to go through with an eighth inch drill bit and just put a very tiny spot that that drill cannot walk out of that V that that drill bit's putting. At least at that point, you can take that small divot that you're putting with the eighth inch and boogie around the car because a lot of guys that I see do this for the first time, they end up sitting there struggling with that one plug weld and that drill bit just keeps walking back and forth. At least at this point, you don't wanna go all the way through both panels because you have to come back at the end and weld all this up. If you do, which sometimes you do go through both pieces because maybe the metal's very thin from the rust, but if you do go through both, it's gonna be a lot more of a challenge to get that plug weld filled back up. As Justin worked through the back edge of this panel, we're pre-planning what angle we're going to put the drill and what side that we're going to actually drill and leave the hole. We have to take into consideration what side, what panel, is it going to fit? Try to think 10 steps ahead as you do this panel. If you want to be efficient, even if it's just a guy in your garage or you're working for a shop and you want to get your speed up, think about what doesn't matter and what does. If we know the upper panel is going to remain in place and it's not going to leave, well, would you rather MIG weld upside down or pre-plan and drill the top side of the pan? That way you can just fill it right up and it's going to land into the bottom of the pan. And it's a real easy thing to take a 36 grit or an 80 grit roll lock and just clean up that plug weld. Sometimes you don't have access. This kicks inward and you can't even get a drill bit here. So if that means that you have to take a roll lock or a belt sander and wear away that bottom pan in this area, all that matters is that we have to separate these two pieces and just work from one end to the other in a slow methodical way, not rushing, thinking about everything as you go. Once you get from one side to the other, we use the STEC tools. STEC makes a really cool hardened, I call them seam busters but it's S-T-E-C-K, and what it's gonna do is it has a sharp blade on one side that you can put it in between, and you can actually leave that tool in place if need be, hammer it in, and work across until you can see the very next plug weld. If the car has 
factory paint or excessive paint buildup, you're going to need to strip the edge around the area that you need to find. If you can't find the plug welds, just take some sandpaper and maybe you rub over it so that way you can see the low spot. Anywhere that a weld seam is going to be, even if it's a plug weld, typically it's going to shrink and be lower so it's very easy to spot as you go through with the drill. As we work around to the wheel wells, we're thinking about what, what matters, right? We have a fender well that on the inside, it didn't matter if he just drilled right through the whole thing because the trunk pan is not going to get reused and you need that actual hole for the plug weld to be reinstalled on the wheel seam. So it was just faster to instead of sitting there and trying to feather the two apart, just drill right through it, use your panel buster and break it apart. In some seams, if you have the majority of the plug welds out, you can, if you turn your pressure down and actually regulate it, use a air chisel. An air chisel, some call it a burp gun, uh, whatever you guys want to call it, but it's, it's a seam buster just like the Steck tool, but it's pneumatic. You just have to be careful because if you start relying on that too much and it's a crucial outside panel, you're going to bend that all up and then you're going to have to come back in and do all the metal work to get it back straight. But up in the front of the trunk pan, it wasn't as irrelevant. One, we had three different pieces of sheet metal up on the front side and it's a lot stronger. So you could actually take that air chisel and as long as you got the majority of the plug welds out, that thing just speeds up your process. And a lot of times if you do it right, you're not gonna tear the pan up that bad. As you get the whole pan perimeter removed from the car, you just need to be thinking, again, we're, we're setting ourselves up for a nice good weld and we can't do that with a rusty edge. So we're gonna use a strip disc, it's a three inch roll lock, and that's gonna go along the surface of that surface rust between the, the weld seam where it comes together and just clean all of that up. And if there's any seam sealer, you gotta get that out. And then if you have any burrs or thick spots from a, maybe a plug weld left, clean that up with a roll lock and some 80 grit or 36 grit. The big thing is you're trying to keep the original sheet metal to the same thickness. You don't want to start making these things thin. Original sheet metal is only about 45 thousandths of an inch thick, give or take what you're using, and you don't have very much to work with. So just be very mindful as you go through and clean that up. A cool thing about a strip disc, it's not removing material. I like to go through and clean all of that rust off with the roll lock, with the strip disc, and then come back hammer and all your edge. If you have an edge that is wonky and it's wavy, you can come back with a flat toe dolly and a hammer and just work that back flat. The other thing is we talked early on in the beginning about how we're planning what side of the weld is going to be needed. So on this case for the back of the car, we chose to have the plug weld at the top because it's a lot easier to weld and a lot easier to grind. But in the wheel well, we drilled all the way through and it's a vertical weld that's not gonna be terrible. You need to get everything clean and you also need to take a mental note of if you have one side that is on the top and another side that's on the inside or flipped, you need to make sure that you pop holes in the trunk pan where it needs it. For example, back here is easy to get to, but on the actual trunk pan on the sides next to the quarter panels, we had to go through there and put holes to make it easy when we actually get the trunk pan in the vehicle to then just come through and clamp the two together and weld it right up. Once you get everything completely prepped, you've got your trunk pan clean, you've got the holes put in the pan where you know you need them for the inside access, you've got the back edge cleaned up. At this point, it may take you a few times to try to test fit how you're actually gonna fit that panel in. Sometimes you might have to bend a flange upward to be able to shimmy that panel into place and sometimes it just makes more sense to cut it. In this case, when we're thinking about time and efficiency, I knew with the hammer dollies that we have and the techniques that we use, it just made more sense to bend the edge up and once the pan is in, we can just hammer and dolly that edge back down, clamp it and plug weld it. A lot of these tips and tricks we go through in our classes here one-on-one -on -one with eight people at a time. If you guys want any more information on what we teach, everything from welding, panel gapping, panel alignment, metal finishing, body filler. So check sylvesterscustoms.com. It's gonna periodically update depending on what we have going on, but it's just a really good basis. I think that a lot of guys 
don't do something because they just think it's overwhelming or it's above their ability. But what we do on the daily does take a minimal amount of tools. Over the years, yeah, we've acquired tools to make our job faster. But if I go back in time in my garage, I can relate with you guys because I did all this stuff with very minimal tools. Once you get the trunk pan into place, you've got to either clamp it with a vice grip. I like the vice grips with the little feet. That way you're not putting an impression down and ruining the metal to where you have to come back and fix. Once you get it kind of roughly clamped into place, you can either use a sheet metal screw to, to suck the two pieces together. You can use Clicos. Clicos are just aircraft um, fasteners that they use when they're putting all the rivets in in the beginning. And it's just a uh, easy tool to depress, put it through the pieces, and it basically sucks the two together. If you guys want, and you totally can, you can use a copper weld in your seam before you put the pan in. Um, there's pros and cons there. I think that that's a question that a lot of guys go back and forth with. Everybody wants to eliminate the fact that there might be rust in that weld seam. But here's the thing. If you want to take the time to actually mark out every one of those holes, put the pan in, mark the holes, remove the pan, you have to still remember that no matter where you have a plug weld, it is burning that area around that plug weld away. That copper weld does not stay all the way to it. There are different products. I know like 90 has some. We have not really tested them yet, but in the future we will where they have like a wax spray that you can spray and it will actually wick in around the plug weld itself to help eliminate some of that stuff. I think the biggest thing is that people get hung up on when they strip their car. Like everybody knows, most people know that when we do a car and we strip it, we acid dip them. But the first question I get is how do you get into all those areas and seal that back up? On a rotisserie with a gun, maybe you have an angled nozzle, any way you can. But you gotta remember that before that car was dipped, all those areas were already surface rusted. All of them. I mean, unless you had like a car that never went out in the weather, almost all of them have it. We took this body off on this lift and you could do this on jack stands, whatever you guys have at home. Just make sure it's secured safely so it's not gonna fall on you. The big thing here is not just jumping to putting the pan in. You guys also have to understand that these panels have alignment holes so you can move one panel. And most of them are 3 8 holes. This pan didn't actually have any, but I know on some of the Mustang projects, we have a 3 8 hole. And when they're putting these panels together, maybe it's in Taiwan, maybe it's in the US, the R&D is not quite there where it fits good every time. Plus, we don't know if your car got in a collision or something like that. The big thing here is taking the time to either make a jig, which in this case, was it faster to make a jig or was it faster to just lower the car back down on the chassis? We are going to put every one of the body bolts into the trunk pan and we're going to make sure everything is aligned where it needs to be before any welding goes on. I would suggest this on every build. We have the Mustang video where we talk a lot about the process of taking every single panel off the car. Don't do any welding until you get everything on and you have aligned each panel and sided it down the car with a straight edge. And we're not talking a 12 inch straight edge, we're talking a string, a piece of round stock, flat bar. You have to make sure that that filler is not gonna end up excessive and have a quality car when you're actually done. Now that we have the car back on the chassis, we're, once we get these bolts thrown in here, we're gonna use a tow dolly and we are going to put that around the edge and that edge that we flanged upward, we're just gonna take the hammer and we're gonna work that flange back down. You don't wanna just curl the edge up all the way to where you're just folding it in. Work a little bit at a time. Metal doesn't wanna be forced in one direction at one time, it wants to be slowly worked up. So if you've worked it up to a 90 like we have it, you need to slowly work that edge back down and, and roll it back and forth with your hammer and dolly working that edge back flat. At that point, you can take your vice grips or your clamps, clamp that plug weld back down and start your plug welds. Let's talk about the welding portion of this. We are going to be MIG welding these uh, plug welds and we're gonna be using a Millermatic 252. I recommend buying a, a MIG welder that actually has uh, gas. You want the argon mix because if you're using a welder that's like flux core, it's just not a strong weld. I do not recommend it, especially if you're putting a floor pan in a vehicle, it's probably gonna fail. 
but how do you test and what are you looking for when you're practicing? I, I would say if you're new to welding, get some scrap sheet metal, cut it, bend it in a 90 like we have here, and then butt the two together. What you're looking at here is you're looking at one side that has a hole popped in it, replicating exactly what we're gonna be doing on the car, and the other side does not. This is much easier to fill that plug weld. And obviously the optimal of this would be using like a pro spot machine like we do have, but for this demonstration, we're using the actual old school method of just filling the holes so that way you guys can actually learn. I like to start, and these are, these are smaller holes. These are about a quarter inch, maybe a little bit smaller. We used a pneumatic tool to just go through and pop these holes in there. And when it's a small hole and you have your temperature and your wire feed set just right on your welder, if you just stay in that spot, what you're looking for is you are looking for penetration on the backside of the weld. The backside of the weld, you don't necessarily want it hanging down excessive, but you want to be able to see that the two pieces of metal have a heat affected zone that is going through both. If your welder is set too cold, you will hardly see anything here. And when you unclamp it, you'll see a gap in between the two. What we want to do is show what it looks like to have a good weld. And the things that we're looking for here is I don't really want to spend a ton of time having to face and grind every one of these very proud welds. So we did four that are about ideal with the right settings. If you go on your welder, most welders all have a chart inside and it will tell you what the gauge is, what your wire size is, and you can get a starting point and play with those settings. What we did here was we went to the settings that was on the welder for 18 gauge, and then we just played with the settings. We would crank up the heat, play with the wire speed, and get the happy medium. What you want is a nice sizzling sound like it's frying bacon. You don't want the sputter and the pop. If you have it too hot, you end up blowing the whole edge away, and then you're gonna struggle with filling that weld. We do have a MIG welding video that goes into great detail, and we do it with Chris, who now works here, and we talk about all of the things that somebody that's never welded are going to do, and we just sit there and critique each little thing. Once you get this done, you can come in. I like to use a 36 grit roll lock on a three inch die grinder, and I come in and I face the bulk of the weld down, and then I usually change to an 80 grit to just finesse it out. Again, we don't wanna make the new metal thin in an area that's going to crack. We want to keep the majority of the thickness of the weld there. But then how do we know if it's a good enough weld or not? I'm gonna do just a couple plug welds with the recommended setting. You want the two pieces to actually tear around the MIG weld, the plug weld. You do not want it to break apart. If it breaks apart, your weld is too cold. The other thing is, our heat affected zone is going to show how much warpage you're going to get in the panel. Maybe you're doing a floor pan or a custom beaded piece and you want to get in and get out as fast as you can with your MIG. So finding that setting to where your heat affected zone is smaller and you keep that heat down by moving around instead of just sitting there continuously welding like we did in this demonstration. The big thing here is the more heat that you have, the more heat affected zone as that weld expands when it cools, it's gonna shrink back below where you have it, and it's gonna pull that panel in. If you're doing a square panel or even a brace, maybe you're doing a hood and you go around the perimeter, when you're done plug welding all these, the center of the hood is gonna do what I call turtle shelling, and you're going to have to address each one of these welds, hammer and dolling and stretching those back out to relax that metal from tension. If you guys think about what actually happens when you weld, if you have a square piece, and you're putting in a floor pan and you weld over here and you weld here, as every one of those plug welds shrinks, it's going to be pulling in tighter and tighter and tighter and shrinking the perimeter. So maybe that's only on one edge, maybe it's not. That's the whole reason that if we're doing this every day, we went with like a pro spot machine that's actually putting the force needed and then electrically fusing the two and the heat affected zone is very, very small. You're not gonna have a ton of that shrinkage but for this everyday guy, DIY, even the majority of the shops that I see, this method is just fine. You just have to make sure that your welder is set where you need it to be for that thickness metal. Hope you guys got something out of this video. If you did, please share it, like, subscribe, and we will see you guys next week.